The scripture reading this morning comes out of the prophetic literature of the Bible, the prophet Isaiah. Some of the words of Isaiah are the most familiar within the church and within the wider culture. Perhaps you know that you can divide the book of Isaiah into three books. Scholars believe there were three different writers or traditions. And our verses that we'll hear today are the very beginning of second Isaiah. Now, why is that important? Because first Isaiah was written to Israelites who saw the writing on the wall and had a sense that they would soon be deported to Babylon. In second Isaiah, we hear the words of the prophets speaking to the people of Israel while they're in Babylon, wondering if they will ever return to their beloved homeland. So from the 40th chapter, the first 11 verses. Comfort. O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Saying to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Here ends the reading from the prophet. These words speak the power of life and they may be trusted. Amen. Very often, Confirmation Sunday happens on Pentecost. Uh, at the end of the program year, so to speak, after Easter. Pentecost, of course, is the, the great feast of the coming of the Spirit. And so confirmation often happens on that Sunday as an acknowledgement that the Spirit has come upon the lives of young people and has prompted them to respond. This year, given people's schedules and the realities of life, we decided to do a 10-week confirmation program here in the fall. And to have Confirmation Sunday be today, the first Sunday of Advent. I want to begin by saying how grateful I am that all of you participated in the program. And not just participated, but you really made the effort to be there as many Sundays as you could. And I know, we know, <coughs> how busy your lives are. <coughs> I was thinking about what significance there might be to have Confirmation Sunday on a Sunday in Advent. Advent is a season of preparation. 
a season of intentional waiting. And we begin the season of Advent with this word. This word, which like so many words, can be overused. The word hope. During Advent, we find in passages like the one we just heard, that hope is not a, a passive waiting, like what Brian McLaren calls a kind of hopeful wishing, wishing that it were otherwise. Rather, hope is active. Hopeful waiting is active waiting. It is waiting that doesn't just require sitting around and waiting for something to come along, but it requires uh, an intentional uh, shaping of life so that we are moving in a particular direction. And so when you, confirmands, when we, the congregation, affirm what it is we believe, when when someone stands before us, as, before us as Forrest just has and makes a vow to become part of the baptis baptismal community, what we are doing is we're setting a direction and we are stating a hope. We're stating a hope that the world will turn out other than the way it is. And our gospel message is the promise that the real world toward which we are heading is other than than the world which we so often see around us. Isaiah, the prophet, was speaking to a people in exile. Maybe you know what exile means. It means to be, to be separated from home. It means to be sent away from that which is familiar. It means to be put into a foreign place where you're having a hard time finding your bearings. The Israelites were sent into exile, away from Israel, and in Babylon. Now, it might sound kind of horrible, but scholars who studied the exile have actually found that the people who were brought away to Babylon were actually the learned folks, the folks with the money, the folks with the power, and the folks with the connections. All the folks who the Babylonians thought these folks could really add to our culture. So they were carried away into exile, and there they lived in Babylon, and there they lived actually not too bad of an existence. Babylon had a pretty strong economy. There was plenty to do. There were good schools, perhaps adequate health care, plenty of Babylonian entertainment to go around. <clears throat> it was not a bad place to be, and not a bad place to live. But the Israelites, the whole time, felt a little bit unsettled. You see, they found that they were longing for home. They were longing for the familiar. And frankly, the gods of Babylon just weren't doing it for them. The gods of Babylon promised that if they just tried hard enough, they would get everything that they wished for. The gods of Babylon said, you know what, look out for yourself. Create your own little altar at home and pray to it, and the gods will look after you. And your neighbor, well, hopefully they'll do the same thing, but the neighbor will take care of the neighbor. You take care of yourself. But the Israelites had this gnawing. They said there's got to be something deeper, more substantial in this whole God thing. This God of Israel wasn't quite like the God of Babylon. <clears throat> Perhaps you can recognize that in many ways we, in our culture, are exiled. We have this gnawing at the center of our life. But there's got to be a fuller, richer, deeper way to live. Isn't it amazing that as connected as we are through uh, the internet and social media, that we still find that we know each other on a deeper level less and less and less. How could it be that we are so connected globally and yet our conflicts have become magnified? How is it that we are exiled from that deeper, richer belonging to one another? I was thinking about, I was thinking about you as a confirmation class. Do, do you remember a time when you couldn't Google the answer to a question you have? Can you remember that? No? Maybe? I thought maybe you might be on that cusp. Before you got your phone, right. <laughs> so the phone brings a certain freedom 
Uh, and that freedom is a certain degree of power. But with the phone, with being able to Google the answer right away to any question that you might have, we just might forget that there are some things that can be known that can only be known by waiting for them. There are, there are deeper structures to our lives, to our souls, to our relationships that are not just simply the sum of our connections. They require waiting. They require nurture, like a, like a seed planted in the soil. You can't <clears throat> dig it up and make it happen all of a sudden. You have to let it grow. You have to nurture it. And so that is what the faith that we cultivate in the church is. It's not the same thing as having a bunch of knowledge on a su surface level. It is about planting a seed and letting wisdom grow from a very deep level. And this is what Isaiah is reminding the people, the people Israel in Babylon. You see, it is right about this time when they are starting to imagine it might be possible to return. And yet Babylon's gotten kind of comfortable, gotten kind of familiar. Maybe we should just stick it out here. And so Isaiah speaks the words to them, comfort, which means with strength. Have strength. Trust that the return home is possible. And then Isaiah, in this incredible poetry, he imagines what the landscape is between Babylon and Israel. It is a long way. It's going to be a long, hard journey. There are a lot of hills and a lot of valleys. And so the poet says, you know what? The mountains are going to be made plain. The valleys are going to be lifted up. You have no idea, but you are just going to cruise home on a highway that God has prepared just for you. I know it's hard to believe, and on some level, it really is just poetry. But the thing about poetry is that once it's spoken, and once that image is planted in our brain, it's very hard to dislodge it. So the people start to wonder, what if God is preparing a way home for us? What if this isn't the only reality? What if we can return to the familiar, return to those deeper structures, return to our deepest identity? And once the people start to get the little glimmer in their eye, the prophet says to them, you know what? Do this. Get up to a high mountain. Speak it out. Jerusalem, be a herald of good tidings. Better things are coming. There is something worth hoping for, worth waiting for, worth working for. And then Isaiah shares this interesting, almost conflicted and, 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 and uh, tense uh, vision of God as being both one with a strong arm. Did you hear that? Your, your Lord will lead on with a strong arm, will, will lead you with strength. And then right after that, like a shepherd who feeds the sheep along the way who gathers up the lambs in his arms and gently leads the mother sheep. See, the God of which Isaiah is speaking is not our pet project. Not the God who just looks at us and says, it's okay exactly as you are, but the one who is leading us out, who is making a way, who is providing the possibility of a new future. If I were to name a sign of hope that I have, it would be this confirmation class. You have moved me over the last <coughs> 10 weeks. And I want to lift up, in general, that I don't think our culture appreciates our teenagers enough. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We, I'm glad you guys are we often dismiss our teenagers and we think that they're kind of cynical. And you, you are. You can be a little cynical. <laughs> but that is not to be dismissed. Did you hear it? It was in the text. All people are grass. What's the point? Nonetheless, get up to a high mountain and speak. And I know that you guys have a vision for a world that is better, more beautiful, more caring, and compassionate than the one that so many of us see around us. And your ability to build relationships with one another. Do you know 
very often when I, we have a baptism up here, I, I invite anybody who would like to come and stand. And often family come up, and it's very beautiful. But every single one of you wanted to get up here to be with Forrest. Do you see, church, the gift that they bring to the congregation? They're modeling for us right there what friendship and support and relationship looks like as the church. They are modeling for us what it means to be church when they show that level of enthusiasm and joy and support and love. But we need you. And I hope you know that you need the church. We're, we know, the church knows, I hope, that it's flawed and imperfect. But it is a place of nurture where we can start to glimpse a new hope, a new possibility, and where we can speak out the good news of the world that is coming. Jesus becomes for us the embodiment of that good news. And it is into his family, and in, it is into his church that you are joining through confirmation today. We are grateful to you, and I am grateful to God. Amen. Amen.